In this short video, we're going to look at uh, linear differential equations, which can be useful in boundary value problems. First application we're going to look at is the deflection or the bending of a beam. So uh, a beam is a uh, long, thin member, which is normally uh, placed horizontally. So the, the long part is going horizontally. You can think of them as joists in the floor or uh, rafters. Um, there's many, many uh, different uses uh, when they build steel uh, buildings. Um, the uh, girders are acting as beams. So we're going to assume that we have a beam. It has length L. It's uh, homogeneous, meaning that it's made up of the same material throughout, the same material properties, and has a uniform cross section. Uh, there's a line, that imaginary line, running through this centroid of the cross section, and uh, that we call the axis of symmetry. And we're going to assume that the load is applied in a the vertical plane that passes through the axis of symmetry. When you do that, the beam is going to have some deflection. It may be very small, uh, but that uh, curve is called an elastic curve or the equation of the deflection. And to model this, we're going to assume the x-axis is running along the axis of symmetry. The deflection is going to be measured by y, or denoted by y. And we're going to assume that downward is positive. Now, the bending moment, so the bending moment is really the force when you have a, the, it is a twisting force. Uh, it's the force that's trying to restore the uh, beam to its original equilibrium position, it, there's an equation relating that to the load per unit length, so W of X. So the, you can imagine that generally you may have um, uh, some uh, pressure load uh, if this is part of a building, and we're going to assume that the, the load per unit length is given by W of X. So there's this second differential equation, second order differential equation, which relates that loading to the uh, bending moment. Now, the bending moment is related uh, to the curvature of the elastic curve. So this makes sense, intuitive sense, that if you had something and you tried to uh, bend it, the more you bend it or, or have that uh, displacement there, uh, the stronger the force would be to try to push it back. Now, we say it's uh, proportional to the curvature. The Greek letter kappa is used to represent the curvature uh, of a curve. So uh, curvature is a, pro it's a geometric property of a curve. And the constant proportionality is actually written as the product EI. And the reason for that is that E is a material property called the Young's modulus. You could really think of it as the analog of a spring constant. Uppercase I is a geometric property of the cross section. It's the moment of inertia of the cross section. And you may have calculated moments of inertia in one of your previous calculus classes. The product of these two constants is called the flexural rigidity of the beam.
If you've not taken Calc 3 or multivariable calculus, you may not have seen this formula before, but we're just going to take it as a formula that if you have a, a curve y equals f of x, that the uh, curvature at any point x is given by this formula. Uh, it's a fraction. On top, you just have the second derivative. On the bottom, it's more complicated. It's 1 plus the first derivative squared, and then you take that quantity and raise it to the power of 3 halves. So we're going to make a big assumption. It's a very important assumption. And it's true in many, many cases that you're going to have small deflections. So you're going to have a very stiff beam. You put a, relative to the load, you put a load on it. And it does make a very small deflection, uh, meaning that the, so for example, the derivative at the, anywhere along the, the, the so the slope, let me put it this way. So the first derivative, the slope of the elastic curve anywhere along the beam is much smaller than one. So you haven't seen this before when you put less than, less than together like that. That means much smaller than one. And so if it's much smaller than one, when you square it, uh, we're going to, and add it to one, we're going to assume that that really is just essentially one. It is, it has a negligible impact, meaning that the denominator in our curvature formula is one. So the curvature would just be equal to the second derivative. So our model now is going to be built on small deflections. And so now if I start with our formula that the moment is proportional to the curvature, which now we're taking the curvature to be just the second derivative. I can differentiate that formula twice with respect to x. And that will tell me that the second derivative of the moment with respect to x is proportional to the fourth derivative of the displacement with respect to x. And remember, that the second derivative of the moment uh, equaled the uh, u equaled the load per unit length. So now we have a fourth order linear differential equation describing the displacement. We need to be concerned about different types of boundary conditions. So one type of situation you may have is where the beam is clamped. Maybe it's embedded in a wall. It's held rigidly against that wall. So rigidly means that it is not going to have any displacement at that wall or embedding point. And uh, the slope of the elastic curve is also going to be zero. So it's, it doesn't bend or rotate about that clamp point. We call this a cantilevered beam or a cantilever beam. The other type of boundary conditions is when we have something which is simply supported. And what that means is that at the endpoints, there can be no displacement. And the second derivative is going to be zero. But there could be, the first derivative could be non-zero. And one other function that may be of interest is the shear force. So that's the force that's passing vertically uh, through the beam. Um, so in the same direction as the unit load or perpendicular to the uh, axis of symmetry, the x-axis, that is our shear force. And that's just found by taking the first derivative of, so rather than the second derivative, we take the first derivative of the 
spending moments. And um, we get a third order uh, term in terms of y. So let's look at an example. We have a beam uh, length L. It's embedded or clamped at both ends. And we're going to have a constant load of W naught. So this is going to bend in the middle slightly. Uh, but at each end, we should see uh, that the uh, slope of the elastic curve is going to remain zero. So our boundary conditions then would be that uh, both the displacement and the slope at each end. So when x equals zero and when x equals l, they should be zero. So we're going to start by solving the homogeneous equation. So we'll go ahead and just have the right hand side zero. We're going to get a, an auxiliary equation with a whose only root is zero, but its multiplicity is going to be four. So that means I'm going to have um, e to the zero x, which is just going to be one. But I'd have that exponential times x times x squared and times x cubed. I'm going to have a total of four terms. So let's clean that up. And so my solution to the homogeneous equation is just a third degree polynomial. To find the particular solution, I really don't have to do any uh, serious differential equations. I'm just going to use uh, basic uh, calc one. I'm going to start with my differential equation and then integrate both sides and until I get to a, I'll integrate both sides again until I finally get to a, an expression where I have just y with no derivatives. And so my particular solution is going to be after anti-differentiation, I'm using the power rule each time, right? So that's why the denominator is two, then it's finally six and then 24 when I have x to the power of four. So it's just the constant times x to the power of four. That's my particular solution. So now I need to find all of my uh, parameters in the homogeneous equation using my boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions when x equals zero um, are fairly easy to, to determine. Um, I do need the, an expression for the derivative, so I went ahead and calculated that derivative. And the boundary conditions when x equals zero tell me that c1 and c2 are both zero. And so if I impose the boundary conditions when x equals l, I'm going to get a system of equations and you can solve that to get your uh, two coefficients or values for c3 and c4. Now it's interesting is that you can do some algebra with those coefficients and get an expression here which says you're going to take the unit load divided by uh, 24 times ei and that gets multiplied by x squared times x minus l squared. And the algebraic representation tells us that your uh, displacement, whether you measure it from the left side or the right side, uh, is going to be the same. So there's some symmetry here. It's going to be symmetric about the uh, line passing through the midpoint. And this is what, that is what we would expect. So let's talk about eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. This is something that's very important if you've taken any uh, basic course in linear algebra. Uh, you will have studied eigenvalues and eigenvectors. 
here we have eigenfunctions. And for the moment, if you have not studied them, don't worry about it. All we're going to do is consider an eigenvalue to be just a parameter in an equation. You can learn about that later. And what we're looking for is the values of lambda, which makes a boundary value problem have a non-trivial solution. So here's an example. We've got a lambda is just a parameter here. So we've got a boundary value problem. And we would like to know for what values of lambda does this boundary value problem have a non-trivial solution. So it's easy to solve. And we're going to consider three cases where lambda is negative, positive, and zero. So if we just look at the uh, case where lambda is zero, um, with these boundary conditions, um, the only solution is y has to be identically zero. And so uh, that's a, what we call a trivial solution. So no eigenvalues there. Remember, we're looking for values of lambda which makes the boundary value problem have a non-trivial solution. So what if lambda is a negative? Well, to simplify the analysis, we'll rewrite lambda as negative alpha squared, where alpha is some positive number. Of course, that would make lambda a negative number. Uh, and then um, we could write this um, in terms of exponentials. But uh, if you recall back in chapter two, I believe, uh, we saw that we can write this using hyperbolic sines and hyperbolic cosines. In any rate, if I impose the initial conditions, I'm going to find that certainly for C1 has to be equal to zero. If I impose the second initial condition when x equals L, I'll get the result that zero equals c2 times cinch of alpha x. So either c2 is zero or cinch would have to be zero, but cinch is never zero. Remember, cinch is um, the difference between two exponentials. And so that'll never be zero. So c2 has to also equal zero. And again, we only get a trivial solution. So far, no eigenvalues. Let's look at the third case, which would be where lambda is positive. And again, for convenience, we'll write lambda a equals alpha squared, where alpha is a positive number. Our solution in this case is going to involve sines and cosines. If I impose the first boundary condition, again, I get C1 equals to zero. But now something interesting happens. The boundary condition when x equals l would tell me that c2 times sine of alpha l equals zero. Now that could mean c2 equals zero, but we're not interested in that. That would give us a trivial solution. But we could have sine of alpha l equaling zero. And that would be true. When is the uh, sine equal to zero? Well, when it's input, is a integer multiple of pi. So alpha L would equal n pi, or alpha is n pi over L. So since there's going to be an, an infinite number of such alphas, we're going to put a subscript on them. And so we're going to look at them as a sequence. Alpha sub n equals n pi over L. And so lambda then would be the square of that. Those are the eigenvalues. So lambda 1 would be pi squared over L squared. Lambda 2 would be 4 pi squared over L squared, and so on. Now, corresponding to each lambda, so each lambda sub n, there's a function, which would be the, uh, a, a solution to this boundary value problem, which is non-trivial. So corresponding to our first eigenvalue, 
we'd have our first eigenfunction y sub 1, which would be sine of pi x over L. Remember, the input is alpha L, whereas the eigenvalue is alpha squared, and so on. We would also have a y sub 2, a y sub 3, and in fact, there would be an infinite number of them. So with this knowledge, if I try to solve the boundary value problem, uh, y double prime plus 5y equals 0, with the initial conditions that the displacement at 0 and L is going to be 0, then we can say right away that 5 is not an eigenvalue. We know what the eigenvalues uh, are. They have the form that we saw in our previous analysis. The only solution must be the trivial solution. So let's look at an, another application. Here we're looking at what's called buckling of a thin column. So my diagram doesn't show a thin column, but the idea is that the, the width of this column is going to be small relative to its height. That would call it, make it a thin column. And you're going to have an axis of symmetry and you're going to be pushing down uh, on that axis of symmetry, and it's supported from below. And if your force is of the right size, then the uh, thin column is going to bend or buckle. Uh, this is really exaggerated. Usually it's a very small displacement. So uh, Again, we're going to have the x-axis running along the axis of symmetry. So the x-axis in this diagram is actually vertical, and the y-axis is horizontal. And I'm just going to give you the differential equation which governs this, that we have a force of P pushing down on the top of the column, and not it's not no surprise that the E and the I appear here. Again, it's going to depend on the material. The E tells us a material property, and the I is a geometric property of the cross section. This is a second order equation, and we just like to find the deflection of this simply supported column of length L. So I can go ahead and re re rewrite the initial or original differential equation in standard form. Uh, to simplify the analysis, we're going to replace the P over EI. P is a constant force. So this whole thing is a constant. We'll replace that with that parameter lambda. And uh, remember that the eigenfunctions then of this second order differential equation have the form of a constant times sine of n pi x over L. And our eigenvalues are the squares. So we would have the uh, n squared pi squared over L squared. We can solve that for p sub n. So in this case, we're putting a subscript on our load. And those give me my critical load. So uh, if I'm not at that critical load, I don't expect to see any uh, displacement or any buckling in the column. So the first critical load is called the Euler load. And its corresponding eigenfunction is called the first buckling mode. So we talk about uh, buckling modes. We're talking about uh, elastic curves. So I hope you found this discussion useful on eigenvalues and eigenvectors. It's just barely scratching the surface. I said eigenvectors, eigenfunctions. Uh, I hope that at some point in the future, you'll take a course in differential no, I meant linear algebra. And you'll learn more about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And you'll learn that eigenfunctions and eigenvectors
and be treated exactly the same way.